This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this special episode of TWIV is coming to you from Melbourne, Australia. You can just see the skyline of the city of Melbourne in the background. I'm sitting next to Albert Lake, which is right next to the hotel where I attended a conference of the Australian Society for Microbiology. And while I was here, I corralled four PhD students and talked to them about their work. So join me now as I go inside and talk about science and virology here in Australia. And by the way, it's July here. It's July in the whole world, of course. But here in Australia, it's winter time. So I got a sweater and a jacket on. And it's not July like it is in New York. We'll see you on the other side of our interview. I'm speaking with two students from this Australian Society for Microbiology meeting in Melbourne. All the way on my right is Carla Giles. 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 <laughs> yeah. Spice in a row. I got it wrong. Carla Giles from the University of South Australia. Welcome. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you for the invitation Thanks. to be here. My pleasure. And on my right is Zoe Dyson from La Trobe University. Welcome. Thank you very much. And both of you were at breakfast with me the other morning, uh, along with, I think, six other PhD students, right? And I, at the end, I asked who would like to come on TWIV, and everybody raised your hand. So you guys are very brave here in Australia. <laughs> Maybe that's one characteristic of growing up here. Um, I want to start by finding out where you grew up and where you were educated. Carla, why don't you tell us first? Um, I'm from a country town. It's a small town of 6,000 people on the eastern, eastern coast of Australia, somewhere mm -hmm. between Sydney and Melbourne. So it's five hours in between mm -hmm. each way. Um, it was a really nice place to grow up, and, and I did my, all of my high school there, and we only had a high school of 500, 500 students, and we were mm -hmm. lucky that we yeah. had a really good scientific program in the school. Uh, and then I did uh, my undergrad and my research degrees at Charles Sturt University in a town called Wagga Wagga, <laughs> and uh, near my hometown, it had a really good biotechnology program, and I stayed there for my honours. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I moved to Adelaide, which is the capital of South Australia, so halfway across Australia, 12 hours from home, and I've been doing my PhD there for the last three years. How did you get interested in science? But what part of your life can you remember back? I've always loved investigating, yeah. and I've always questioned, and science has always always had a calling, and, hmm. and all through high school it was science, science, and more science. And hmm. Were either of your parents scientists? Or no, my parents, we, we, I'm off a farm. We grow beef cattle, and and they also have business and mm -hmm. science. My, my dad particularly is always interested and always talking about science and, and following it on the news and in the media, but he's definitely not a scientist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, being, having a farm involves some science, I think, right? Yeah. There's many aspects. Yeah. In fact, one of our listeners is, runs a farm and he's really interested in microbiology because I think there's a lot of microbiological related things that go on oh, in a farm. Well, like yeah, in every part absolutely. of life, right? Yeah. So you're in your third year of the PhD program? Yes, yeah, so I've, I've just started my fourth and will be final, final year. <laughs> what made you come to the University of South Australia for a PhD program? Um, I was looking for a particular project. I wanted mm -hmm. to do adenoviral vector vaccines or viral vector vaccines. I wasn't too worried about which virus was the, the host vector. Um, and I wanted to go and work with a highly respected professor and I was lucky to um, be be given the opportunity by Emeritus Professor Mary Barton to work with her in her labs and they had a really nice adenoviral vector vaccine mm -hmm. development um, for a horse pathogen actually called Rhodococcus equi so I uh, moved across the country. So you moved just to work in that program yeah. specifically? That program, that lab, you yeah. know, it ticked all the boxes. And you had a poster the other night I saw. Yes. Right. right. And Zoe, what about you? Where did you grow up and where are um, you educated? I'm Bendigo born and raised, um, which is about two hours from here in central Victoria. So I did my undergraduate at La Trobe University there and I studied um, a double degree in both computing, um, specialising in software engineering and web development. Wow. And then... Uh, 
<laughs> yes, please. <laughs> um, and I also studied a degree in applied science in biotechnology and environmental chemistry. Mm. So um, I went through that and um, in my second year I took my introductory microbiology class and loved it. Mm -hmm. So I did my honours in phage work and I've continued to work in bacteriophages in wastewater. In my what, PhD. what year are you in your PhD? I'm writing up at the moment. Oh, you're done yeah. in lab work. Yeah, I am. Okay. <laughs> That's great. And do you remember why you got interested in science? What was the interest? Um, like Carla, I've always been interested in <laughs> science um, and possibly uh, in very encouraged by my father, who's a geologist. So um, always going off on fossil hunting mm -hmm. expeditions and things like that growing up. So, yeah. Nice. So let's talk about what uh, you have done, Carla. You're a year away from finishing. Can you tell us a little bit about the work you've done? Yeah, so um, Rhodococcus equi is a respiratory pathogen of foals in particular, and, mm -hmm. and it causes a huge amount of, of, of damage to the horse's lungs and affects their health and their welfare. And it also has a really high mortality. And for, for decades, researchers have been trying to find a preventative measure because antimicrobials, it's long-term, three months, dual my antimicrobial therapy, which is just not viable in a horse. Um, and so... These ha these occur in horses that are on farms or racehorse, that, that sort of... Everything. So performance, racing, it's a worldwide, worldwide problem. Um, Is it in wild horses? Yes. Huh. Or wild domestic horses. Um, it has since... They found in Mongolia with the Przewalski's horse, there was no no uh, rhodococcus equi there until they reintroduced and re-released Przewalski's horses. Do you have horses on your farm? Yeah, we do. Ah, yeah. So this is probably one of the reasons subconsciously you'd... Uh, possibly. <laughs> it's interesting. It, it, it does make it uh, easier sometimes to go to the lab and do those hard hours because yeah. you know that one day you can hopefully help help a horse somewhere and, and that's nice. And how, how is it transmitted from horse to horse? Um, aerosolized, it, it's thick laurel. They're, they're not entirely sure, but it's an environmental pathogen. So it's out in the soil everywhere. Um, and then this, uh, the horse is acquired from the soil and then they pass it on to other horses? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a virulent, uh, there's a plasmid associated with this bacteria that causes virulence. Without the plasmid, it's not a problem. With the plasmid, yeah. it'll, it'll cause pneumonia and um, significant health problems. So there's hot spots all over the world, particularly in Kentucky and the mm -hmm. US and, mm -hmm. and here in, in the Hunter Valley where we have a lot of high density breeding okay. programs. And they can kill the horse too, right? Oh yeah, oh, just the foals, not the adult okay. horses generally, unless they're immunocompromised or okay. there's something else going so on. So tell us what, you're, what you've done with adenoviruses. Adenoviruses, so um, what we what we wanted to do was find a, a new a newer method to deliver the vaccine into the um, into the host, mm -hmm. and so we decided that the adenovirus was a really good candidate. It um, works well in in infant models, and it's right. shown to be quite a, a good um, viral vector for in in puppies and in in piglets and they also are using it in tuberculosis infants it's in clinical trials at the moment so we thought we would investigate mm -hmm. its use and its ability to to take the antigen into the body into the host um and we're, we've 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 done a few few trials and it's looking good at the moment in and horses uh, no just in mice in the small model um so you can put the bacterium in mice and they get infected yeah, uh, because horses are, are so difficult to work with and, and they do get so terribly sick when they're, when they're challenged, we um, try to stay away from the horse model in the mm -hmm. early testing. Um, first we look for a viable candidate and then once we, we've done some troubleshooting with mm -hmm. it, we then take it into the large animal model. So did you construct the, ini the initial adenoviruses? Um, we, we used a commercially available one in this proof of concept studies that we've done. Um, we did this to see whether it is a viable option mm -hmm. before we went and, and looked at, at doing some other work with yeah. some host-specific adenoviruses. Um, it, to, to do it the other way around would have, would have been a very tedious, long journey, sure. just manipulating the viruses. Is, but is you put the way. antigen gene in it from the bacteria, right? Yeah, so we did insert some antigens into the virus, mm -hmm. um, some specific ones. Right. And um, we were 
able to, to grow, like test for protein expression mm -hmm. and, and grow our buckets and buckets and buckets of, of virus <laughs> mm -hmm. from there. And then you also did mouse experiments where you would infect with the adenovirus and look to see if the protein is made, right? Yes. And then you challenge them? Yes. And you yes. did those experiments as well, right? Yes. So um, we use Western and RT-PCR in cell culture to check mm -hmm. for the protein presence. Um, and then we'll, we take it into mice trials. And um, first we look for the immunogenicity and the ability mm -hmm. of the virus to produce the antigen and the system to see, see the antigen and create antibody. Uh, then once we've done that and tested for safety, tested mm -hmm. that the virus isn't shared into the environment by RT-PCR, we then um, went and challenged, mm -hmm. challenged the mice, so we vaccinated them, challenged them with aerosolized rotococcus, um, similar to how it is in environmentally. Right. And then we look for clearance of the, the mm -hmm. bacteria out of the lungs. How do you immunize the mice? Um, intramus intramuscularly. Muscularly? Yeah. Okay. So we, we stay with intramuscular um, vaccination primarily because it's a good way in a horse to deliver a vaccine. Yeah. Um, it's safe. It's something that mm -hmm. most people can do. We would in the future look at other routes of administration mm -hmm. and see if there is a, a better alternative to create a better immune response. So in the next year or so, when you hope to finish, what, what remains for you to be done with this project? <laughs> <laughs> what remains? That's a good question. Um, we've also been looking at other equine adenoviruses there's mm -hmm. two serotypes so we've been looking at the, the the genomes and the characteristics of that and um we hopefully will go and um see whether that's a, a better a better vector or a viable mm -hmm. ve vector um i've got one more mouse trial to do with this proof of concept study just to tidy up a little bit of our data and and then write up and finish off all the little bits and pieces right. in the lab so, so you're not going to be working on any of the horse experiments, right? Not at the moment. Our funding has just finished yeah. for, for the mice trials and it was only to, to check the proof of concept and check mm -hmm. the viability of the vaccine. And uh, we hope that we will get further funding to, to take it that next step and, and see if, if it is as, as good as we hope it is. But your lab would like to take it to the next step, right? Oh yeah, definitely. And they could do, if they got funding, they could do horse trials, right? And then um, it would maybe be approved? I don't know what the regulatory issues are for a horse vaccine. Um, like everything, it, it's a long, long yeah. process. It's, it's not as long as the human process. Um, we're lucky horses don't go into the food chain, so yeah. we don't have the problem of, of genetically modified organisms right, or, right. or viruses being transferred into the food chain. Um, we'd have to get approvals. Once we'd undertaken our, our preliminary horse trials, we'd hope to take it into some bigger studies um, it, it's still a long way off, sure. off, off being commercialized or anything. But I, if it did get commercialized one day, even if it's 10, 20 years, wherever you are, you're going to look at it and go, man, that's cool. I was part of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it'd, it'd be really nice to see, see the, to take it into horse trials and, and take this vaccine a little mm -hmm. bit further. It's showing promise and the industry desperately needs a preventative measure that right. can help them. Right. That's great. Not everybody can get in on that kind of applied project. It's really nice. Yeah, yeah. and it's really nice that there's already the Alvac, the canary pox right. viral vector vaccines in, in horses and in, in dogs and ferrets. So there is already that precedence of having this type of yeah. viral use, uh, viral vector use in, in the horse industry. Yeah. So. It's neat. So Zoe, you're almost, you're writing up yourself? Yeah, I am. What have you done? Fa a bacteriophage project? Yeah, right? I have. So our lab uh, has worked in microbiology of wastewater, PI? Professor Sevier. Um, okay. And I've been a part of his lab for a while now since my honours. And that lab works on wastewater microbiology in a number of aspects. Okay. Um, the project I'm working on is a different approach to controlling a problem called foaming that occurs in activated sludge systems worldwide. And it's caused by a group of really hydrophobic bacteria called the mycolata. And when these grow up in large numbers and prol proliferate those mm -hmm. systems, uh, along with surfactant narration, they produce this massive foam. So if I go to a, a sewage treatment plant yes. and you see the foam on the top, that's what you're talking that's about. That's what I'm trying to uh, come up so with an approach to deal with. 
A couple of reasons. Uh, it produces poor quality effluent, the plants do when this foam actually occurs. Mm. It also has the potential to aerosol pathogens from that plant into surrounding neighbourhoods and could affect plant operational mm. staff. And even just um, from an aesthetic perspective, it's not pleasant to look at. And it can actually cover walkways of the plant, making them hazardous mm. for operational staff as well. So it's a big concern because it does occur globally. And right now there's no way to deal with this? There are a number of ways, but they're not um, universally effective. Okay. And the chemical treatment methods available actually don't you just specifically target these bacteria. They target all the bacteria in the system and affect other communities that we don't necessarily want to You want them affect. to process the sewage, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's a bit of a problem that nothing's targeted in okay. that way. So fudge are very, very appealing because they are very specific in their host range. Yeah. yeah. This is a great application, right? I think it's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. I've heard of one other phage, I say phage, excuse me, you know, <laughs> for phage um, to clean uh, food surfaces get rid of listeria. Yeah, there's right? it's listeria. been approved in the USA a spray that has phage in it and it yeah. kills any bacteria. That's pretty neat, right? I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Is that a car? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Is. So, what did you do to uh, get rid of the foam? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've embarked on a large fudge hunting mission, so I've been isolating fudge from all sorts of samples, primarily wastewater, because we'd like to actually reintroduce at a higher number a dose of fudge from that system. So do you go to the wastewater plants yourself? I do, yeah. <laughs> and you, you scoop I up some samples. Uh, foam, right? Um, foam is ideal, but also the mixed liquor of the system itself. So you go with, with sterile containers, right, do, labeled, yeah. and you collect from multiple um, wastewater plants or just All one? over Australia. Really? Yeah, I also do soil wow. samples and water samples as well. <coughs> yeah. And what do you do with them? Uh, I do enrichments to actually um, try and isolate fudge just mm -hmm. specific for those bacteria. From those samples? From those samples, yes. So the assumption is they're already phaged there. Oh, there are, yeah. And you just want to get them? Yes, so we want are to they, are they lysogen? Or we've been very fortunate. The majority that we've isolated are lytic phages, which right. is ideal for a phage therapy um, project. Yeah. So our aim is to actually combine these as powerful cocktails and apply them to the plants and target only those hydrophobic organisms, break them down and hopefully prevent some of these foaming incidences from occurring. So you take back the examples, you, you concentrate them? Is that right? Or what you, you mentioned some process that you use. Uh, we actually just do regular enrichment. So we'll grow up our, we've got a large collection of these hydrophobic bacteria in our laboratory. Uh, okay. So we actually grow the bacteria, um, place them with media and the environmental sample, incubate okay. them, um, centrifuge, mm -hmm. filter, and we apply the filtrate and look for plaques. Okay, so yeah. you're looking for the presence of phage in the environmental samples and you're using indicator bacteria that are known to be in the foam, which you have in your laboratory, right? Uh, we're basically just isolating specific for those hydrophobic bacteria. So, we're, And then right. we're doing characterization studies looking mm -hmm. at how broad they are in their host range. Mm -hmm. And we've also done genomic studies as well to try and make an assessment whether they're right. suitable or not, yeah. How many different phages did you isolate? I've got 52. Our mm -hmm. laboratory's got a large collection from previous students and our postdoc as well. And what kind of phages are these? Tailed phages or something? everything we've looked at under the TM so far is a syphophage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, syphophage. So, so that's very, the tailed, right? Yeah, long, non-contractile tails with double-stranded right. DNA genomes. Hmm. And but you know that you have 52 different ones by the genome sequence. Is that right? Yeah. And they have? Do they have host specificity as they well? They do. Yeah, they um, vary in their specificity. Some mm -hmm. of them are quite broad. Um, and some of them are quite narrow. So ideally, we'd like to use the more broad ones in our cocktails to target as many of these organisms as we can. How many different organisms do you have to target, do you know? Um, it's, a big, it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So there's some ones that always crop up in foaming incidences. Gordonia amorase, the predominant one that always appears. Um, there's also um, Scamania piniformis, and they have this unique branching morphology, so they're branching filaments. Hmm. They're the majority, yeah. So did you, um, so the, you, you cultured the phages on bacteria that you have yes. in your lab. Did you ever go to the, did you ever recover bacteria from the foam and test your phages on those? Um, we've been very fortunate that we've had past students who've actually mm -hmm. gone through and done a lot of that work. Yes, yeah, so I've been able to use their strains, mm. yeah. 
So your, your thesis is going to be a summary of the isolation and characterization of these phages, right? Yes, it will. And yes. if I presume the lab is going to continue this project. Oh, yeah, we're definitely continuing. So what's, what's the next step? Uh, there's a collaboration between us and University of Melbourne going on at the moment to design um, cocktails mm -hmm. and to actually develop a delivery method as well to apply these to the system. So it will have to be somehow put onto these foam. Yeah collections in the waste plant, right? With yeah. sprayed on, for example? Uh, they're looking at a variety of approaches. Um, so. And they have to go out and test your cocktails next on them. Yes. What'll be the, what are they gonna look for? The foam going away, for example? Uh, it becomes a tricky thing to test because you've gotta wait for the foaming incident to occur before right. you can actually. So they're looking at a variety of different ways to monitor that at the moment. So the foam doesn't always occur in every situation, I guess, right? No, um, they do crop up under different conditions. Yeah, but you're not yeah. going to be around to see that, right? No, I won't be. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere else. So, uh, uh, yeah, it'd be exciting to see what happens. Of course, it's yeah. another apl similar applied situation yeah. where what you've done may at some point be used. So let's say it, the trials work out, then th this would probably be sold commercially, this cocktail of phages, to waste treatment plants and then they could use it whenever there's a foaming incident right? Absolutely. and if yeah. it were, had to be sprayed on and then it would go away and then fine and then if it happens again they they spray it on yeah. do you think that you will select for resistant bacteria by doing this that's over a and very over? good question uh, I think the cocktail approach is a good idea because yeah. if you're targeting different receptors and you're also using multiple fudge it's a lot of mutations that bacteria is actually gonna have to go through mm -hmm. to become resistant so I think that's a good way of actually addressing mm -hmm. that issue but you think that we'll um, that we'll use phage one day to treat infections of people or animals? I do think so. Well, it's yeah. already going on in Eastern Europe, and yeah. so I think um, it does it definitely have a place in the medical world, whether that place is combined with antibiotics or fargilane. We've done a couple of shows on, uh, especially on this week in microbiology on phage therapy, and um, one of the shows someone was saying it's going to probably be first be used for topical infections, where you don't have mm. to put the, the phage in you and risk getting an antibody response, you know, and then move on from there. So speaking of moving on, so you're gonna, you're writing your thesis? Or I you? am, yes. And then you're gonna defend it? Yes. And what's next? Looking for a postdoc. Uh -huh. So I'd love to stay in FARGE or genome sequencing if I could, that's the idea. Do you wanna stay in Australia for that or do you wanna try overseas? I can't decide. Um, there are some great phage labs all throughout the world. There right? are, there really are. All over the place. So I'm definitely willing to move around. Uh, I know Jeff Miller at UCLA, not too far from okay. here. Well, it's like a 14-hour <laughs> flight, but I flew out of LA, through LA, and he recently isolated phages uh, specific for Carinibacterium acnes, you know, the bacteria oh, that causes fantastic. acne. Yeah. And um, they want to use it for acne therapy. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so you should. We don't all the help we can get with that. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine? Well, that's a bacteria that everyone has on their face and then under adolescent mm, conditions, absolutely. right? Uh, I guess it thrives on the oils that are produced, but that's a, you should look into that lab. It's a fabulous yeah, thank, lab. Yeah, and, well, thank uh, you. But there are also, uh, you know, do you know, have you heard of the, um, Fire Project by Graham Hatful. So he's at University of Pittsburgh. He has high school students come in the lab and they get soil samples and I isolate their own phage and yeah. sequence it and then name it it's after themselves. They actually they come up with wonderful names. They're great. Yeah. This is just great. But anyway, they're, you should think about going overseas for the postdoc. Come back. You can always come back to Australia, but it's good to get a different perspective on science yeah. and so forth. That'd be fantastic. When you uh, do a postdoc, what's next then? You want to be? Do you want to have your own lab one day? Or I would love to have my own else? lab one day. Yeah, absolutely. So you yeah. have computer skills as well, right? I do. That's yeah. going to help, right? It must have helped already with your. It's sequence, been very right? handy with. Um, knowing a little bit of programming and actually being able to write my own scripts when I can't find something that Scripts. will do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm at a loss. I can't do that. And uh, so I stay away from big genomic projects. I think that's a big advantage that you have. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so you I hope so. Definitely, absolutely, because we're in the age of genomics, right? Mm -hmm. Tons and tons of sequences. And you yeah. have to be able to, I mean, I, um, in my uh, project to identify rhinoviruses in wild mice, I'm told that I'm going to have you know millions and millions of bases of sequence, and I don't know how to analyze it. 
because yeah. they say there's no real programs. You have to write your own packages. Yeah, I think that's a fairly common problem yeah. as well. And it's only going to get bigger as we produce more and more data. You should write packages. And I have written a couple them. of little things. But sell them. <laughs> Commercialize them for us. I, I mean, should. We could, yeah. we could use, other people could use them. I don't know if it's so specific to every project, but it seems to me that, you know, uh, deep sequencing data, you could write a package to analyze it in a facile manner. Yeah. If you have the skills and you know the biology as well, you should do that. Well, uh, Carla, you have another year, but what are you thinking of doing? Um, I want to stay in research. I'd really like to do a postdoc. Um, it, it, if I get the opportunity to stay and continue working on, on this project, that would be fantastic. But mm -hmm. it would be nice to, to go to the US or Europe and expand my skill set and my network and, and meet some vaccinologists doing mm -hmm. some amazing, amazing work that they are, that's happening throughout yeah. the world. So you want to stay in the area of vaccines? And yeah, I, I really do like, like the, the vaccine world and, and it, it's a nice way to... To, to see the real world application of microbiology yeah. and, and be able to help people and animals and and try and and create something that can help some pretty insidious diseases and did prevent you, prevent them. Did you hear the the uh, public lecture the other day, Gus Nossel? Right? Yeah, it was fantastic. All the vaccines we need to develop, right? Yeah, they there's should. a lot, and <laughs> and they were just human vaccines. You go into the veterinary and agricultural world, and it's it's phenomenal the amount of diseases that don't get enough attention there, and yeah. and especially in the in the poorer countries, if if you can find a way to help make their animals healthier then that those animals are more productive, they have more food to feed, more milk, more, more, more meat, more yeah. something to, to feed these families that need more food as well. So yeah. it, it's, it would be fantastic to be able to help create something. I just spoke with someone before who uh, wants to immunize koalas against the chlamydia that's infecting oh. them. You probably know that work, yeah. right? Yeah. That's great, so that's a great example where you have a problem. And, but you know, as you heard from Gus Nossel the other night, there's a big anti-vaccine sentiment globally. Is that the case mm -hmm. here in Australia too? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. We are very lucky. Our government supports vaccines mm -hmm. and it, it's an opt-out system rather than an opt-in generally. Um, and that means we have an, a high vaccination rate, but mm -hmm. that is dropping, sadly. Mm -hmm. How to fix that problem? What do we do about it? <laughs> <laughs> there's no easy solution, right? I don't think there is. I think it's understanding and communication of the science and, yeah. and allowing the, the greater population to, to understand why the vaccination is so significant and how much it can help. And, mm. and the, no doubt soon there will be a infectious disease that causes a, an epidemic and, and it will be serious. Mm. It's, yeah. it's inevitable, really. We've been lucky to have so long where we've, we've been without some of these really terrible diseases for so long now because of vaccination. Well, there's no shortage of labs that you can go to for a postdoc and get more experience in vaccines of all sorts, as you said, in the U.S. I would also encourage you to go out of the country for a while and, you know, get a different experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was really lucky. I won a travel scholarship through my university to go to the U.S. Uh, for a month mm. in, in October, actually. So um, I'm in the process of looking for labs and, and hoping to go and visit a few and see what they're doing. And so this would be to get an idea of which one you might want to go to, Oh, hopefully. Right? Yeah, <laughs> that's, good. that's a good plan. Yeah, and just see what techniques they're using and, and see where I may fit in best mm -hmm. if, if that comes to be. It'd be fantastic. Well, if you come to New York, come visit and you can have your photo taken in front of the I wall will. of polio. I am right? going to New York, so <laughs> oh, I will take you up on you that have to, yeah, If you're in New York, you have to come and we'll get your photo there before they take the wall down. That was an impressive down. wall. <laughs> it was, really was. I, I love it. I, and I'm, I'm working on a wall of rhinovirus too, but I haven't put that together yet because we do a lot of plaque assays there as well. So uh, what's the, what is the mindset of PhD students in science in Australia? You know, in the US they're pretty depressed because funding is tough and they don't see a career future. What, what do you think here? Uh, you guys are all, everyone I've talked to is upbeat, so. Yeah, I think it's mixed, but I think most people are really optimistic mm -hmm. um, and we love what we do, so. It's very yeah. typically Australian to be optimistic. <laughs> I think <though>. so. Um, <laughs> we, we are lucky, we do, for Australian citizens, we do have a lot of government support for scholarships mm. um, and there, there is a lot of national funding which allows 
for the medical research particularly. Mm. So there are a lot of PhD opportunities here in Australia and there are fantastic labs to work with in doing world quality research. Absolutely. Um, the question is postdocs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, like like all, all countries, the postdocs are more competitive and harder to come across. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm impressed you guys are really um, high quality. Your work is really nice. You're eloquent and you're enthusiastic. There's a lot, I see a lot of passion. And if that's all true, then you're not going to have a problem. You'll find a postdoc and you'll do what you want to do. It's just a matter of deciding and then going after it. So um, I'm impressed with Australian science from what I've seen. Good. <laughs> so nice Carla Giles, is that right? Giles. <laughs> <laughs> is it prion or prion? Prion. Yeah, I asked my class that, and then I can't remember what they say, prion. Carla Giles. Yeah. Jay Giles Band, that's why I'm thinking there's a, there was a rock band in the U.S., Jay Giles, and maybe that's it. Carla Giles, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Zoe Dyson, thank you. Thank you very much. Two more great examples of the really neat science that's going on here in Australia. I'm speaking today with two PhD students who are here at the Australian Society for Microbiology meeting in Melbourne. On my, all the way on the right is Brianna McLean. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. Or whatever podcast this will be. <laughs> and on my right is Caitlin O'Brien. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And Caitlin, you're from the University of Queensland. Yes. Which is in St. Lucia. And Brianna, you're from the Australian Infectious Disease Research Center. And you, uh, you guys are in the same university, basically. Yeah, it's but the same. Building. Brianna's, uh, you're a separate research center within the university. Right? It's an affiliate. I could say it's an affiliation with our lab. Right. So Caitlin and I are actually in the same lab. Oh, you are. Yeah. yeah it's okay. I've just talked to you for ten minutes and I didn't realize. Oh, okay. <laughs> Again, we're both. Um, it, the Australian Re Infectious Disease, uh, oh, sorry, Disease Research Center is actually in the University of Queensland. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, Brianna, are you from Australia originally? I am from Brisbane, born and raised. And high school, and now, and you went to college as well. Yep. And now you're in graduate school in the same city. You exactly. never left home. Nope. You have, you have family in the area as well. Um. Yeah. My um parents have always lived on the north side of Brisbane, and I'm living with my brother at the moment. Hmm. Hmm. Caitlin, how about you? You from the area as well? Yeah. So I was born in Bundaberg, so uh -huh. still in Queensland. Um, went to high school <laughs> on the Gold Coast, still in Queensland, and now I've come back up to Brisbane okay. for my And PhD. why are you interested in science? What got you interested, do you know? I suppose, yeah, I just, I really enjoyed it in high school, yeah. and I've always been a bit of a, I guess, like a sci-fi nerd, yeah. and yeah, so uh -huh. I guess that maybe helped. So you did me. well in, in courses in high school? If I tried, yeah. <laughs> I realized that I tried, I could actually do okay, and that sort of propelled me forward. <laughs> it's funny, I talked to a professor recently in the US, she has her own lab, and she said at some point she realized she had to stop partying and study, and then yeah. she got really good at, at science. Yeah. How about you, Brianna? What got you interested in science? Um, it's the only subject I've ever really been good at in school. <laughs> so yeah, I've always loved the research aspect and discovering um, new things, and that's what science is. So, so I've always so loved it. So you're a what year PhD student? I'm a second year PhD student. So you're in a lab, you're doing your research already, yes. right? And what year are you in? I'm in my first year. I just started in January. So have you yet picked a lab that you're going to be working in? Yes, so I, I'm in the same lab I did my honours in, and basically my project is a carry-on from that. So I've been really lucky. I've just I've known what I'm supposed to be doing uh. from the start. So, so you say you did your honours in. What does that mean? So um, we do a year of, I'm not sure if it's the same everywhere, but we have to do a year of honours, which is just like a really brief research project for a year. Um, and I did that, yeah, in, in Roy Hall. So that's part of every PhD program? Um, it's bef it's a, a requirement to do honours before you can actually progress on to PhD. But it is part, oh, so if you're, if you're admitted to a PhD program, you do an honours first? Yes. Yep. It's, it's a requirement for that, and then you go on into the lab. So in your case, the honours was done in the same lab that you're yes. in now. Yeah. Yep. Did you do an honours? Yes, of course. Yes. It's required in the yeah. same lab? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you did your year honours and now you're a year into working in, in the lab. Yes. Right. So um, 
Tell us what you're doing in the lab, Brianna. I'm actually screening mosquito pools for the presence of what's called insect-specific flaviviruses. Mm -hmm. So they're a type of flavivirus that's transmitted primarily between mosquitoes. And we believe that these viruses have the ability to uh, regulate the transmission of pathogenic flaviviruses like dengue in the mm -hmm. natural mosquito population. And how are they transmitted from mosquito to mosquito? It's parent to progeny. Okay, transovarian yes. transmission. So, do you go out and collect lots of mosquitoes? No, but I really like to. It's good to get out of the lab every once in a while. <laughs> Field work is always, it, it's, it's a really recent addition to virology. And, yeah. But you don't get yours yourself. Where do you get them? Um, we get them from our collaborators. So, mm -hmm. some pools get sent from the Torres Strait, others just from local cities like Brisbane mm -hmm. and Sydney. And is there anything that's preventing you from going out? Or does your PI just want you to be <laughs> in the lab doing experiments? Um, no, not really. Um, for the next part of my PhD, I'll actually be doing a bit of in vivo work with uh -huh. these sorts of viruses. Okay. So I'll have the opportunity to actually rear a mosquito colony oh. and look after it and <laughs> see how that goes. Before I go further, who is your PI? Uh, Professor Roy Hall. And yours as well. Same, Can we Same just say, PI. Hi, Roy. Because he loves <laughs> <laughs> He loves TWIB. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, this is great. <laughs> students here on TWIB. So, Brianna, you get these mosquitoes. Yeah. Um, and I presume you don't look at individual mosquitoes, right? No, it's far too many. So, they actually come to us in about pools of 100 mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Some of these are just whole mosquitoes, and we need to homogenize them on our own. So all that means is that we suspend them in media, mm -hmm. put in some glass balls, and shake them up so the mosquito uh, bodies get broken. These are all the same species in the pool? Yep. What species are they, typically? Um, it depends uh, on the site of collection. So mm -hmm. if we were collecting in Brisbane, we'd get a lot of Culex annularostris mosquitoes. If we're collecting in Sydney, we might get a lot of 80s Vigilax mosquitoes. Okay. Yeah. So you grind them up and then what do you do next? Uh, we perform an RNA extraction mm -hmm. and then we do a flavivirus specific RT-PCR. So you um, convert the RNA to DNA and then you yes. use primers, flavivirus specific primers to amplify. Yes and then you sequence the products? Yep. And when you sequence it, you can tell that they're, what do you, what do you tell from the sequence, for example? Well, we put them through a program in BLAST. Mm -hmm. So that's a um, rather large reference website that we use mm -hmm. to determine viral sequences. It's used for bacterial and I'm guessing also fungi as well. So we take the small piece of sequence that we get and we run like a homology test right. and it will come back if it's flaviviral in nature. So do you get different flaviviruses all the time or do you get the same ones over and over again? Um, it depends with the work that I do with targeting um, non-pathogenic strains. Mm -hmm. So a lot of... Strains, non-pathogenic flaviviruses, yes, so, right? Um, so a lot of what we get has already been tested mm. for particular flaviviruses and taken out. So. We don't actually get a lot of flavivirus sequence, to be honest. Mm. And you don't get the human flavies because they've been yes. subtracted out, you say, right? Yeah. So what, ac what are you actually looking for? So I know that you want to look for these flavies that go from mosquito to mosquito, but at what point will that project, say, be done? What, what, what's the goal? Um, well, I've already isolated a new species of flavivirus. Mm -hmm. So that is the type of flavivirus that we're looking for. Um, at the moment, as far as I've gone, is I've characterized the virus a bit in in vitro. And then for the next part of my PhD project, I'll be characterizing it in vivo to figure out transmission mechanisms and whether um, it affects, say, the fitness of the mosquito as well. Mm -hmm. And then we're putting that into um, an infection model so we can see if ISFs actually do have the ability to suppress early replication of pathogenic flaviviruses. So you'll have to reconstruct one of these viruses that you've identified by sequence, right? Well, we have an isolate of it. Oh, you do? Yeah. And where did you get that? By grinding up mosquitoes? And, exactly. And how do you rescue virus from them? We just culture it in C636 cells. So they're mosquitoes. A mosquito mosquito cell line? Exactly. Ah. And you can tell if there's a virus, you get cytopathic effect? For certain viruses, we will. For the virus that I've isolated, it doesn't actually cause CPE. Okay. So how do you know if it's growing? 
Well, we just test it by RT-PCR. We've also um, inoculated a mouse with purified virions. Mm -hmm. The mouse is seroconverted and we have, we're actually in the process of developing monoclonal antibodies. So you have this, this is a novel flavy. It's yep. not a human pathogen as no. far as you know, and it just, you think it goes from mosquito to mosquito, yep. right? And then, so the next phase of your thesis is to infect mosquitoes with it and see what it does to them. Exactly. Right? And then after that, presumably you'll be done. How many, how many years typically does it take to finish? Um, most people do their PhD in three and a half to four years. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to do any studies of the replication of this virus in cell culture? Um, we've done a little bit of that already. Yeah. So we've looked at how the virus will grow in C6, C636 cells. We've also looked at how it will grow in RML12s, which actually have an intact RNAi pathway. We've looked at replication in Culex species mm -hmm. mosquitoes, as well as Anopheles mosquito. So what about the, um, the idea that you mentioned initially, which was that these viruses affect transmission of pathogenic flaviviruses? Are you ever yeah. going to get to that part? Yourself. I will, hopefully. <laughs> so what are you going to do to, to look at that? So what we do is we'll establish a persistent infection in an 80s Vigilax mosquito colony okay. with the virus that I've isolated. Mm -hmm. We'll then introduce um, a virus like West Nile virus Kunjin strain and see if, or actually rather look at how the Kunjin strain will grow afterwards. Okay. Yeah. And that, so one prediction is that it's going to stimulate replication in some way, so that would affect transmission in a positive way? For Quinjin or? Yeah. Oh, hopefully not. <laughs> you, you want to go the other way. You think it will impact, negatively impact. Yes. So these are, are, would be beneficial exactly. flavies, right? Because they're going to inhibit transmission of pathogenic exactly. flavie virus. Okay. Is there any possibility of going out into the wild and asking, so this virus you've got, what's the prevalence in mosquitoes? That so, sort of thing. We could. Um, so. I had a look at 100 mosquito homogenates. These were collected mm -hmm. in Sydney in 2007. From 100 pools, there were actually 38 pools which were positive. So as far as naturally occurring ISFs go, that's actually quite high. There have been other instances where they've looked at Culex pipiens mosquitoes mm -hmm. and found prevalence in natural mosquito colonies. Um, something I also want to look at is, and our collaborator at the University of Sydney, Cameron Webb, will be giving us a recent collection of 80s Vigilax mosquitoes, right. and we'll be testing them to see if the virus has actually okay. persisted. So if you um, show that infection, do you have a name for this flavivirus? virus? Silver water virus. Still water. Silver water. Silver water, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and what's that from? Is that where it was? It's an old suburb in Sydney, apparently. Oh, silver water, that's yeah. nice. Silver water virus, Yep. SWV. Yep. Um, if you show that it inhibits, say, replication of uh, Kunjin, right? Would yep. you want to know the mechanism? Would you study that as well? If there's time, I would, hopefully. Okay. Yeah. Nobody yeah. knows yet. There's only been one previous publication on this. So it's okay. all completely novel. Well, that's good, right? Yeah, it's really that's good. It makes it everything you learn is new, right? Exactly, right. yeah. That's very good. Caitlin, how about you? I know it's early for you, but yes. what are you um, working so on? So I've been working on basically the tool that we use to, uh, that Brie and other people in our lab use to screen the mosquitoes, mm -hmm. or mosquito homogenates. So basically um, our postdoc and my supervisor, Jody, she made antibodies that were supposed to be specific to the first uh, insect-specific flavor virus we found in Australia. Mm -hmm. And we ended up getting these two antibodies which were binding to all different viruses, so flaviviruses, alpha viruses, and we were really quite excited because we thought, oh my gosh, like mm. this is going to be, you know, a novel, you know, mosquito host protein. Or, so we thought, because those viruses are so different, it's really yeah, yeah. unusual to pick, be able to pick them up with one antibody. So my honors project was basically to determine what these antibodies were detecting, and now my PhD is will be to continue along that line and characterize them some more. So basically, our antibodies bind to double-stranded RNA, hmm. so, and they bind non-sequence specifically, so um, basically they bind to the, the structure of the double-stranded RNA, RNA helix. Yeah. And yeah, it's been, they've been really useful. Yeah. We look at like the replication, the genomic RNA replication in mm -hmm. flavian and alpha virus infected cells with them. You can pick up double-stranded RNA viruses. We can pick up 
I think the most useful thing is that we can pick up, you know, really divergent flaviviruses like Breeze, where they, we can't actually pick them up with any flavivirus-specific antibodies that we have because mm -hmm. they're that different. How do you use this antibody in your work? So we inoculate C636 cells, mm -hmm. we harvest the supernatant and we fix them, and we just perform a basic ELISA using the antibodies. I see. Yeah. So you mentioned because these viruses don't cause CPE, so this is the way you pick them up. Exactly. Okay. How was the antibody made in the first place? Um, we have the novel, or the, the first Australian ISF, Palm Creek virus, which mm -hmm. Roy actually... What's ISF? Uh, uh, Insect-specific flavivirus. Got it. Sorry. You said that before, Sorry. right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. You get so caught up with your acronyms. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> That's what my job is. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my our supervisor, Jody actually went on to inoculate mice to make insect uh, these antibodies that would be specific to PCV so we could um, further characterize so that the, first the inoculum virus. was? Um, was um, Palm Creek virus, which was the first Australian ISF. ISF, right. And yeah. it was purified virus? Yes, yeah, it was. It was yeah, well, we assumed it was yeah concentrated <laughs> purified virus. Right. Mm -hmm. Somehow we got yeah, double strand RNA mm -hmm. antibodies out of that, which we're still not entirely sure how that happened, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it was sort of just really lucky and yeah, it was Well, really there are a couple of possibilities. Maybe there, there might have been a little double stranded RNA. Yeah, you know, that's come out but in there. A little might not be enough to make it. Yeah. These are monoclonals? Yep, right? monoclonal IgM antibodies, yeah. And then the other thing I would, my guess is maybe the virus is replicated in the mice a little and yeah. made double stranded RNA. I mean, it, it shouldn't, but. Yeah, do you know if they actually replicate it in mice or not? Um, we don't know for mice, but we've tested you know, numerous cell lines. We've tested avian cell lines, um, a lot of different vertebrate cell lines, yeah. and we don't get any replication. Um, <coughs> So, so if you yeah, will this antibody recognize like synthetic double strand yes, like does. poly IC? It does, it does. Yes. So that's actually how we first figured out that it bound double stranded RNA. It, you in did poly that? IC. That yes. was one of your experiments? Yeah. No. If yeah. you take an uninfected cell and stain, will you see We do see um, background binding. Yeah. So well not really it's actually true binding. Um, yeah, I was gonna so, say yeah. the the common um, assumption is there's no double stranded RNA in, no, yeah. in cells, right? Been, yeah, but there is actually Do you think that's true? No I don't. <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of endogenous double stranded RNAs. So we've actually found that these antibodies combine fairly small double stranded RNAs, so they should be able to pick up um, primary microRNAs, huh, pre-micro yeah. RNAs, so yeah, things that are actually being made in 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 wow. uninfected cells. So there's probably no, not long double-stranded no. RNAs in cells, but they're all short there part should of the microRNA. Yeah, I think um, microRNAs that can, and primary microRNAs can get to about 80 base pairs in length. Okay. So, okay. so they, they can... Got it. Yeah. So. Has this been published yet? Uh, this antibody? Yeah. And it's in the works, hopefully the works. very, very, very soon. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so Is it, did you talk about it at this meeting at all? Oh, I've got a poster, actually. Yeah. So Have actually you done tonight. a poster or a talk? No, I have a talk tomorrow. Ah. Yeah. Good luck with that. I'm a little <laughs> you know, nervous Nervous? <laughs> no, it'll be Fine. really interesting. I'm going to come because I want to hmm. hear the, the, the whole detail. It's, it's cool. It's just lots of interesting data. And what are you going to do uh, for the rest of your thesis? So the thing I love about these antibodies is that they've just enabled me to just do completely different yeah. parts of science. Yeah. So I'm hoping to do a bit of crystallization, mm -hmm. um, a little bit more work because they're actually IgM. So there's not, it's, I mean, it's not the most well studied antibody. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to do a bit more work on IgMs. Uh, there's a few more um, thing experiments that I can do with virus infection and the antibodies. Uh, we're also looking at making more double-stranded RNA antibodies. So yeah, there's, I'm sort of still, I guess, prioritizing yeah, what I want to do surely. next, but yeah. So are you interested in how the antibody binds to the I double am, strand? I really you want am. That's when yeah. you get a um, structure of the two together. Exactly, yeah. So there have been some crystallization um, done of uh, cellular mm -hmm. RNA, double-stranded RNA yeah. binding proteins with double-stranded RNA. I'd love to do the same for Neat. IgMs, yeah. So, Brianna, what uh, is next after you finish your PhD here? What are you going to do? Not entirely sure. <laughs> That's the hard thing to answer. Um, I'm really hoping that I can get a postdoc position maybe overseas, still in infectious disease, maybe mm -hmm. um, focusing around mosquitoes since I now have the yeah. experience. So Lots of great labs. Exactly. Doing mosquito work. Exactly. I mean, even in the U.S., um, there's the guy in Colorado or Arizona, I can't remember. I just saw him last week. It's not Dick Bowen. Bla no. uh, 
Brad Litvich? Oh, yeah. He does. No. Hmm. Oh, man, I can't remember his name. But uh, anyway, there are hmm. quite a few labs. Oh, not Aaron Brault? No. <laughs> There are lots of labs like in the that. U.S. Yeah. Do you want to go to U.S. or Europe? Um, sure. I would love a job anywhere, to be honest. <laughs> anywhere I could get a job. And you want to do something with mosquito viruses, right? Um, if I could, because that would be mainly what I've been trained in now. Yeah. So, but even going out and doing something completely different on a different virus, perhaps, would be a really good learning curve. What do you want to do eventually after your postdoc? Do you have any idea? Not yet. Not yet? No. Nope. You don't know if you want to do a PI track or something totally different, right? PI track would be rather cool, but... Yeah, it's I, hard, right? Yeah, I've heard it's very difficult to get into. Yeah, so. but you want to come back to Australia eventually? Yeah, eventually. My family's here, so... Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Caitlin? I know it's early, but... Yeah, um, I really, I'm really interested in bat-borne viruses. Ah, wonderful. Really interesting. Um, but honestly... I sort of, I guess I toss up between doing just pure research and maybe doing something that's maybe a little more applicable now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I guess something to help with infectious diseases that maybe vaccination, something like that. Yeah. But it's very, yeah, I, I really can't, <laughs> I can't so, decide yet, I yeah, guess. You know, no, I but understand. It's, it'd be nice to feel like you're actually doing something that's really directly. I always wanted to help human health yeah, myself yeah. from the earliest days I remember. I wanted to do something that was relevant. Mm. I thought it was important. I'm not sure I, I ever did, but thinking that you're mm. making a contribution is good. Yeah. You know, it's important. Um, but there's a great bat virologist here in yeah. Australia, right? In, in Geelong. Yeah. 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 Might, He's excellent. You might do a postdoc with him. Possibility. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Well, he, yeah, he, I'm he sure might, that's he very might watch. After. He might watch this Maybe. episode and <laughs> keep you in mind. Yeah. It sounds like he's got a big Excellent. operation there and lots of money and this is important to study bats and yeah. biology right i just think they're so fascinating the this just the way their immune systems yeah. work and oh it's just yeah, i think that's a good incredibly cool thing to work on because there are a lot there are not that many labs doing yeah. bat biology you can There's carve out a little yeah, bit niche. for yourself and yeah. you want to have a lab of your own someday you think i think so I th yeah, at the moment, that's what I think. Yeah, but, no, that's uh, fine. You know, I mean, things, things change, change, absolutely. But you can always start out with yeah. some goal. Yeah, right? well, we've definitely had a really good, I guess, um, example from our supervisor. He's, mm -hmm. He runs an excellent yeah. lab, and, yeah. yeah, he would be the kind of, I guess, <laughs> PI I would want to be. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. It's, it's important to pick a good mentor. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, very lucky. It sounds like you have. Yeah. You guys see each other every day, right? Yes, we do. <laughs> we were actually living together as well. Uh. So, <laughs> so this, is this your first uh, scientific meeting? Uh, I would not. Not for me, it's not. This is the mm. first time I'm actually presenting a full-length mm. talk but I've previously been to an ASM in Brisbane and the MCAA meeting at the Gold Coast last year. Okay, mm. and, and this is your first? Uh, it's my first one I'm presenting, but I was lucky enough to be able to attend for a couple of days the Arboviral Symposium mm -hmm. last year as well. I, I was just in Fort Collins, Colorado, and uh, this is backtracking, but there was a bat meeting yeah. uh, that Lin Fa went to. Oh, okay. It was after the American Society for Virology meeting. Oh, they yes. had a three-day bat meeting. They had 100 oh, wow. people at this meeting, so oh, people cool. are really interested yeah. in bats. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you like this meeting, this ASM? Yeah, it's, really no, but, yeah. it's quite good being broad because you get a good idea of what mm. everybody else is looking into, and then you pick up on techniques that mm. you would have otherwise missed. Mm. Yeah. Is there enough virology at this meeting for you guys? I uh, always love a little <laughs> bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. It, it is still nice. It's nice to be able to, yeah. I guess, still be able to look at other aspects of yeah. science and not mm. get too like, I think boxed in. Be, I think it should be 50-50 viruses yeah. and bacteria. Mm. And it's usually not that, but that yeah. would be good because yeah. you need to have enough of your own um, yeah. as well. There is an Australian Virology Society as well, yeah. right? I, I think Paul Young started that. Yes. It's <laughs> kind of splitting Paul off Young. the virology. Yeah. So that's what happened in the U.S., the... Virologists split away from the American Society for See Microbiology, mm -hmm. made their own meeting, yeah. and they, they have all virus talks. It's yeah. wonderful. If you ever have an opportunity to go to that, yeah. you should jump because it's really good. Yeah. And you can get travel grants uh, as well to attend that. Mm -hmm. So, Great. you know, in the U.S., um, funding for science is getting very difficult, and a lot of students got kind of demoralized because of that. And, you know, they really want to do science, but 
they're not sure that they'll be able to? Is it a similar situation here? Um, it depends on the government funding that we get for research mm -hmm. opportunities. So there's a few things that are going around, I think. Yeah, I think it's a little bit like, I know people who have done all different degrees and they've all had problems getting jobs, so I don't think it's, it's just science. And I don't know, I'm sort of a firm believer if you really want to do something and you really put everything into it, I think, you know, you make good, good contacts and you show that you're a good worker and I think you, you give yourself the best chance you can. I, I think that's the best attitude. That's what I yeah. tell people all the time. That's what you can do, right? If you're really, if you're really sure you love and it. passionate, just do it. Yeah. And it'll work out. Do you feel that way too? No, oh, definitely. <laughs> I'm not good at anything can't else. Can't see you doing anything else. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but yeah. being good in science is fine. Yeah. Right. right. So well, um, I wanted to just ask a little bit about the PhD program. Do you have courses that you have to take as part of it? We are very lucky. We do not. No. Really? I think some PhD. I know. Isn't in Singapore they have to do lots of courses. Oh, I don't do. know how they do that. Mm -hmm. um, some honors courses, like depending on the school, so maybe it's the same for PhDs. They do yeah. a lot of courses. So very few courses, but you have some. We have. We well, you said you have to do a bachelor degree first, mm -hmm. and then you can either do an honors degree or a master's degree for entry into the PhD program. But even okay. for those, um, yeah. like you know, year-long course, we don't have actual coursework. We just have, mm -hmm. you know, our assignments yeah. or like our, our write-ups right. and our experiments and. Yeah. I'm kind of, yeah. And then God, how many years is it typical? Three, four years of completing a PhD? Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> is there a limit? Um, nine years. <laughs> nine years. <laughs> but that, like, you won't get support for all that time. Yeah. But you, yeah. can, you can work and support yourself and write up for nine years, yeah. yeah. And you get financial support for attending the program, right? A stipend of some we sort? We do get a stipend. We're okay. very lucky, yeah. yes. Is that paid by uh, the university, by a... Well, we have an APA, which is a government scholarship. Yeah, the Australian post okay. Postdoctoral Award. Mm -hmm. And in the course of your PhD, do you have like committee meetings to assess your progress, that sort we of thing? We do, yeah. We have Canada milestones. Yeah. You have yeah. a committee that watches over you? Yes. Yeah, we, we pick a board, right? Yeah. yeah board of reviewers. And how has it decided that you're ready to defend? For the thesis defense. You've got sort of like kind of loose guidelines, I think, yeah, loose yeah. time limits. You've got, um, first you have your confirmation, mm -hmm. which you present in front of the committee and they assess whether your project has significant direction. Right. And then you do a mid-candidature review, so they just, of course, review your progress. And then within a year of that, you have thesis review if you're prepared. Right. Yeah. But they're pretty, they're really yeah, they're understanding, quite pretty lax, yeah, yeah, like just, they understand that things don't always go well in science, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. <laughs> things of course. don't always go to plan, so. Yeah, of course. Well, you guys are great. Uh, you have exciting projects, and uh, yeah. I'm, I'm really exciting. happy that you're excited about science. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Brianna and Caitlin, thanks for joining me Thank today you very much and for talking. Us. And Thank enjoy you. the rest of the meeting. We, we will. definitely will. Thanks. Thank you. This episode of TWIV can be found at twiv.tv and at iTunes. And if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to twiv at twiv.tv. I want to thank my four participants for talking with me today about their research and science here in Australia. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.